have Devin Castles to speak next with us. Devin is the co-founder of Hyro, a platform built on Ethereum that enables artists to sell scarce digital goods to collectors. Cool. All right. Thanks, uh, Ben and Ryan, for putting this up, uh, putting this on, and also to uh, Philly Blockchain Tech. Um, it's pretty cool to be involved in like the Philly blockchain space, which has been a really uh, fast-growing uh, kind of hotbed for interest in the blockchain space. So I'm really excited to uh, talk in front of a group of enthusiasts. Um, as Ben said, uh, my name is Devin Castles. I'm the co-founder of Hyro, which is a platform built on Ethereum, uh, enabling artists to tokenize and sell digital art and assets to collectors. Uh, hence the title of the talk, The Rise of Rare Digital Assets. And uh, thanks to Ben for a, a great um, talk before this, kind of getting the conversation started on NFTs. And hopefully you can all see uh, how this can be one interesting application of non-fungible tokens. So uh, Ben covered this a bit, but I thought I would just give another quick example. Um, we use, like to use a, a quick example about fungibility versus non-fungibility. So you can see a list of a couple different fungible items versus non-fungible. Uh, the example that I like to give is uh, commodities, which is uh, pretty easy to understand. If I have a barrel of oil and you have a barrel of oil, people are very uh, OK with trading that back and forth. They don't really care which one they have because they're, for all intents and purposes, fully exchangeable. One barrel is identi uh, exactly identical to another. You compare that to uh, rare coins, for example. So if you have the 1943 penny made out of copper that sells for eighty-five dollars to $100,000, you're not going to be too eager to sell or to trade that for a different penny. right? They're both pennies, but one has a characteristic that the other one clearly does not have and makes them fundamentally different and uh, a reason why you wouldn't want to exchange them. So I thought it might help to go over the token landscape as, as it exists right now. Just for a heads up, all of these numbers are as of the end of the month, so April 30th. And as everyone knows, changes very fast. But uh, you have basically like Bitcoins and their forks. That's Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Gold, uh, Standard Bitcoin, which is obviously the largest, Litecoin. That makes up a big chunk, about $193 billion. Then you have the Ethereum grouping, so that's uh, Ether and uh, or Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, which is Ethereum Classic is a smaller portion of that. And then a group of ERC20 tokens built on top of the Ethereum platform, which are um, using the Ethereum platform to basically create their tokens on top of it. That makes up about another 131 billion uh, of value. We then have Ripple, which is its own standalone platform, another really big one in the space, at about 33 billion. And then I've lumped together everything else into another category, a number of different projects, at about 75 billion. So you can see this whole group in the blue um, is about at the time about 430 billion. Again, it, it changes pretty rapidly. But you can see this red square up at the very, very top here. And what I'm pointing to there is that's actually ERC721 uh, non fungible tokens, right? <clears throat> so that's actually probably, if I had to guess, that's probably an overrepresentation. The biggest kind of application of value that we've seen so far in this space uh, is CryptoKitties, which is a lot of what people are very interested in. Uh, it's difficult to value the market because of illiquidity, but probably in the scale of tens of millions of dollars as opposed to you know, billions. So it's a very small part of the market, something that has not existed for very long. So the question logically right, is, at this talk, we have five presentations. Why are there two of these talks here? Why are we interested about it? Why is it cool? Why is it unique? Why is it um, something that you might want to start a company about? Right? So uh, just digital collectibles. Ben touched on this uh, for some cool ideas. Um, just a couple other ones that are up here. Uh, just want to put them in front of you. Another kind of real world example is tickets. Right, like you, ha you could have a thousand tickets to a venue. They're all tickets to a concert, but you wouldn't trade those among each other because I might have a front row seat and you're up in the Raptors. Um, <clears throat> a number of different uh, options there, and functionality. Uh, these are pretty consistent across blockchain technologies, but prove ownership on a digital distributed ledger, um, buying, selling, and trading them, and then also holding for appreciation or used for enjoy, uh, enjoyment in an application like a CryptoKitties racing game, for example. Uh, did we lose? I think we might have lost it, Ben.
<laughs> yep. So Hyro in uh, particular, so now moving on to kind of a, a specific application of these non-fungible tokens. Uh, we're very interested in the art market. So I wanted to give a brief overview of kind of how has crypto, of art, uh, crypto art come to be and how has it evolved in a relatively short amount of time. Um, there's a lot out there and I just want to touch on that briefly. Happy to go into a lot of uh, detail afterwards if anyone has questions. Um, the first example that uh, we really saw at scale uh, with an interested community behind it was Rare Pepe's uh, based on Pepe the Frog, which has a, a kind of crazy interesting history of itself. But basically the idea is there was a whole community of people that were interested in creating cartoons, drawing them and submitting them to the Rare Pepe team who would then decide which ones were uh, good for the community, which they wanted to put out for as, a, as, as an issue. And they would create a set of digital cards. So there might be 100 of one rare Pepe card, uh, 150 of another one. And then those cards were distinct for uh, among themselves. So if you held one rare Pepe uh, token, it was uniquely different from another one, right? So this was kind of the first time that we saw um, non-fungible characteristics within the cryptocurrency blockchain uh, environment. This was a, a technology that's still thriving right now. People are very interested in the community. Um, and it was built on or is built on Counterparty, which is on top of uh, Bitcoin. So different set of technologies that we work, but that was kind of the first project with a lot of uh, or adoption that um, kind of used some of these characteristics. Next was uh, uh, CryptoPunks. So that was a project, kind of the first stepping stone into the Ethereum landscape. Uh, the developers, it was a pretty small team, decided to launch a project where they had basically 10,000 digital characters um, with ERC-20 tokens that were meant to represent each one of those characters. So it was still ERC-20 in nature. The tokens were still technically uh, fungible, but there are characteristics with their platform that enable them to kind of connect these tokens to these images. So this is kind of the precursor to 721 and a project that got people thinking about non-fungibility tokens built on the Ethereum platform. Uh, CryptoKitty is the big one. Everyone kind of talks about and knows about. That was the real call a game changer that uh, got people excited about uh, ERC-721 and non-fungible tokens on Ethereum. Uh, between November and December, the whole thing exploded and you had uh, a big explosion in market cap and interest. Um, it was kind of an early standard version of ERC-721. It's since the standard has since been adapted and standardized a little bit more, but it was the first one to use ERC-720 characteristics where you were actually able to embed specific information within the token to make them completely different from another token. Uh, and the last one I have on here is the Forever Rose. So it's a bit of a step um, back in terms of token technology in that it's using the ERC-20 standard but the reason I have it, uh, it, was, it was sold in uh, Valentine's Day of this year, and it's by an artist you might have heard of called um, Kevin Abosh, who is a, favorite, or a very famous uh, portrait photographer who famously sold a, a portrait of a, a potato for a million dollars, right? Sells a lot of portraits of celebrities and very, very famous guy. He entered the space and basically sold these 10 tokens for $100,000 a piece. With the representation, in his words, the art is the token, right? So the person's buying and owning, and uh, they are buying for the value of the token. But he's offered up this rose, this portrait of rose, as kind of like a symbolic representation of that token. So not ERC-721 in nature, ERC-20, but really cool because it's the first time that we've seen a really wide-scale, wide-known, famous artist start to explore how does my work interact with blockchain, blockchain technology? How can I start to think about what artwork in and blockchain data looks like? So entering Hyro, uh, we are a company that's trying to take that discussion to kind of the next, the next level. So what we do is we work with digital artists to help them uh, tokenize their digital art, connect their artwork to a series of ERC-721 contracts, and then allow them to, uh, through our marketplace, sell those, uh, that digital art to collectors. Um, <clears throat> the big thing we were talking about a bit back and forth and having a debate about what's the value or what's the um, unique attributes of this technology that is really necessary, well, we think that 
uh, in digital art. That's a very, uh, it's, it's a very um, unique need that it's solving because files online before the introduction of ERC-721 and blockchain tech uh, suffered a lot from the ability to share them without fear of being very easily copied, uh, freely exchanged, downloaded, where none of the values make it back to the artist, right? That, that issue of copy-paste and losing attribution back to the artist at this current period is rampant. It's really for digital artists, uh, I think, kind of like Napster era in 2000, where you put our art there and it's just free for anyone to take, and it really takes away from the artist. Um, briefly, it, it provides a marketplace. So once you buy a token, you can, you can appreciate and view the art online, but you also, if you wish, you can sell that on the marketplace and exchange it with other users. And the last part that uh, we're most excited about is it changes the economics for artists because with blockchain tech, uh, we're able to not only attribute initial sales back to the artist, but also future sales back to the artist. So when the art is transacted through our platform, uh, we'll give a percentage of that transactional value back to the artist so they can benefit from the appreciation of the artwork. So really, really trying to solve for this problem with artists where they had to go through a period where they're underappreciated, uh, have to basically give away their artwork for a long time to get recognized and noticed. Uh, collectors reap the large lion's share of that value, and then uh, they have to either wait a long time until they're recognized as a well-known, valuable artist, or sometimes you know they never see that in their lifetime. So this is hoping to uh, change that dynamic. A couple just quick screenshots. So uh, we are in uh, beta right now. We're live on the uh, Rink of B testnet. Uh, I'll show a slide at the end where any of you can go to our beta site and poke around. Um, there are some instructions available for getting set up with test ether and Rink of B. It's a little bit confusing, but we can certainly help with anyone who's really interested. We're looking for people that are interested in the project. Um, my gallery, so basically what you're seeing is after you've purchased a piece of artwork from an artist, you'll see the artwork. Um, and then we're working on a number of different uh, functionality aspects within the platform that help you tackle this problem of feeling connected to that artwork, right? So it's not some just abstract token in your wallet that you don't get to see or understand or interact with. Uh, building out some functionality that you can really connect with and appreciate and enjoy your art. One of those aspects is a certificate of authenticity. So this is just a certificate that you will get um, in your account that uh, certifies that you own the artwork. You can see a view transaction component there, which basically connects to Etherscan. And you can see on the blockchain the uh, transaction history. And you can actually see your transaction and proof of ownership on the, the Ethereum network. Uh, and then what happens is after you've sold your um, piece, if you decided to do so, that certificate wouldn't exist in your account anymore. The characteristics would change within the certificate. So if you were to even save it or try to save a link or whatever, it wouldn't connect back to any sort of transaction history on the blockchain because you've sold your piece of artwork. And then just a quick snapshot of the marketplace showing functionality of uh, if there is a piece that's sold out, for example. Um, asking price, you can see here there's an initial price which the artist listed it at, a highest bid and an asking price. So if you own a piece, you can submit an offer or list it for sale. Other people in the community can buy it. Uh, and if you don't have a piece and you want to buy it from another user, you can submit bids. And we have a marketplace contract up and working that basically works with those bids and offers and connects them and matches them if there are any crosses and exchange the artwork automatically. So there's my information, beta.hiro.io, and my email address. Um, like I said, we are, uh, we've been developing this for roughly the last six, seven months now. Um, and we're at a stage where we, we have our uh, beta version up on the Rinkaby network uh, with the go, goal to go uh, live on the Ethereum mainnet relatively soon. Um, so if anyone's interested in testing out the platform, becoming an early beta user, poking around, exploring more about it. Uh, we are more than happy to answer questions, hold hands, do whatever. We're always looking for people to test things out. So thanks for your time. I appreciate listening to more about NFTs. Sure. So um, like a traditional art, right? Yep. You buy a Van Gogh, you put on a wall to tell the world 
I have a Van Gogh. Mm -hmm. How do you collectors display the art while they own it? Sure. So uh, we're working with a couple different ideas on this component. I think the first for um, enthusiasts in the space is, believe it or not, controlling or owning something within a wallet is somewhat like uh, among the people that are interested is somewhat like displaying that. Having that token in your wallet does convey some value, which as I was coming up in this space uh, was a little bit foreign to me, but it, it does with people who are early adopters, uh, they do appreciate and have that as a point of pride. Um, secondly, we're working on, this is probably a down the road development that we're working on, but essentially uh, an idea we're calling print and burn. So there's a concept in, um, token uh, blockchain tech, which is basically burning. You can send to a wallet that is owned by no one, and when you send it to that wallet, it's gone forever, right? It completely wipes it off the face of the earth from existence. No one can ever retrieve it. It's gone. The service that we're envisioning is basically you could choose to send your wallet to their, your uh, token to that address. When you do that, then we will basically print, like an on-demand printing service, and ship you a physical version of your art. So if you want to do that, you can basically have a version of your artwork um, in your home. The trade-off there is that you can't then print it and then go and sell it on a marketplace and have both things with the profit and the ownership on your wallet. Um, the third thing is there are a number of different kind of digital displays that are existing. People are coming up with ideas for digital frames. Um, so we're actively looking at possibilities of working with um, either integrations into machine or uh, technology people already own, like TVs, or dedicated uh, services that basically you can display artwork on in kind of high resolution versions. Uh, sure, go ahead. Um, so, going back to crypto data, because we can't talk about that. Um, <laughs> so, when and they had, a, they actually had a pretty uh, uh, detailed in, uh, document about how they did the bidding during the thing because like every bid essentially would be and it's here, like it would actually run uh, exhaust gas because you were actually you know so like they had this, they had this whole mechanism on how they would do basically blind auctions I think um, are you doing anything like that or is it just a hey I'm gonna attempt to buy this uh, and then I'm gonna spend my ether making that call to get it but if somebody else gets it by that time I may not get the artwork but I've spent ether or, or, or the gas for picking sure so just to give everyone a heads up, kind of similar to a lot of the other people that are talking, I'm not actually in the coding aspect of creating the contracts. Um, our, we have another like, lead developer who would be way better at answering that question. But the thing that we're working on, just kind of like layman's terms, is we're looking at a number of different trade-offs in terms of what uh, are given up by different term types of marketplace constructions, right? So. Um, submitting everything to the blockchain versus trying to match off blockchain and submit. Like, there's a lot of different possibilities of things that you could do that have trade-offs um, with uh, how quickly it runs, the security of that. Um, another thing that we're actively looking at is the Ethereum project's uh, planned development of um, sharding and proof of stake and some of the things they're working to do to rapidly increase the ca capacity of the network. So it's a little bit difficult with this technology where you're developing and everything's kind of a moving target, right? Like we were developing Decentraland proposed uh, an ERC-821 protocol. We used that for a little bit. Then the Ethereum community kind of got behind 721, so we reverted back to that. The Ethereum network is uh, introducing a lot of different aspects. It just, it's such early days in this technology that some of the decisions that you make, you're, you're kind of aiming for a moving target. So. It's kind of a long answer to that, but I, the real answer is uh, we're still working the best manner to handle a marketplace contract at scale. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious. So if I understand, one of the things that gives the token its value is its authenticity. And what I mean by that is, um, let's say there's only 100 available copies of uh, this uh, image of the rose. Um, is there a risk that somebody who owns one of those copies could make copies of themselves and distribute those images out through, you know, through the internet? Yeah, it's a good question. So 
what we're yeah what we're looking to do is basically expose different parts of the artwork depending on the phase that you're in right so when I don't have a live view of it but basically when you are initially looking at a piece you don't actually see the full piece all at once as it is it's kind of obscured a bit and you have to buy it to be able to unlock a full kind of like view of it on your screen when you do that and it's on your screen you're seeing something that's acceptable for a um, kind of digital display on a laptop, but which would not be great at all for uh, distribution, replication, or printing. Think of like when you take a picture on your phone, and it's very low res, and you try to blow it up, and it looks terrible. So we're basically, when someone owns a token, exposing a low resolution version of that, where they can still in, like enjoy it in a digital sense. But if they're trying to copy it, and like we're storing the high resolution version on the back end. And then if they were to use something like, an integration with uh, hardware or a print and burn, that's where we bring in the super high res version, and then we expose that for the final version of viewing it. So it never actually exposes the full digital. Right. Some of the artists that we're working with are sending over file sizes that are enormous and really non usable in you know, a website functionality as it is. So we're, we're working with artists who are sending over really, really large files. So we're exposing kind of smaller versions that you can enjoy and view, but uh, if you're trying to rip the version, it's not going to perform very well for you unless you like blurry photos on your wall. So you're turning these larger images off the blockchain, right? Right, yeah. So the, it's cost prohibitive at this point to store on-chain. On Is there anything that artist does to the, uh, the, the work in the physical world to indicate that it's had some kind of uh, digital echo? Uh, so are you referencing like if someone had like a painting and then this is like an uploaded version of the, right now we're working with only digital art. So it's not something that it's like a picture of, you know, you wouldn't be taking a picture of a Monet and then uploading that picture and selling it. These are digital artists who are creating them in digital mediums. Um, and so it really only exists in digital form. So in the fullness of time, do you think there is some sort of a link between the real world and the digital world? Yeah, I think definitely. I mean, there are already a couple of projects out there that are working with, uh, there's a project called Verisart, I believe it is, and there's one other that I'm forgetting, but they're basically looking at providence and ownership of digital or physical pieces where they're working with very high-end curators and verification processes of art to create ownership of high-end, valuable, physical artwork on the blockchain. Um, we're kind of taking the other aspect of that where we think that uh, currently, the market for digital art is, is pretty small, but something that could be extremely, uh, like, much, much larger. So we're focusing on uh, the component of digital art at this point. Does that mean Veris art? Uh, Veris art? Yeah. Uh, so when a, when a ERC-721 was minted, like, say, a uh, crypto keys or the higher like, smart contract mints one, is there anything embedded? inherently in the token that tells it what, like, that it's a kitty or what it is? Or does it completely depend on, like, the app and, like, the developers to tell it what it is? Yeah, so it, there is... Like, in, like inherently in the ERC, like, could I take the, the that token uh, to some place that's, like, not CryptoKitties or not Hiram, it'd be able, like, something else be able to tell it what it is? Yeah, so my understanding of CryptoKitties, for example, and not super technical with it, but is that it's basically um, just a hash sequence of characters, and then those characters within their platform mean something. So basically it's the interaction with that, like in the ERC-721, their token has a field which has this hash string, and if this hash string ends in, uh, you know, zero, zero, for example, then that's a googly-eyed cat. And any cat that has that specific, it's almost like a DNA strand or something else where it has like all these different sequence of numbers that mean something. So if I were to just look at that token to a human or off platform, it would just look like this is just a 721 token with some strange bit of characters in it. But when I plug it into the platform and I have something that's able to read that string, then it creates the image that represents those characters. Could theoretically tell that it is a different though? Yeah, I mean, the, the really cool, some say it's awesome, some say it's difficult for uh, companies, but a lot of this, really all of it, is uh, open source, right? So these contracts have to live publicly. That's the nature of decentralized applications. So uh, theoretically, if you want to duplicate the contract code, I mean, think about uh, in cryptocurrencies, everything that people have done with forking. 
There's nothing to stop someone from forking and creating uh, a, another cryptocurrency. It's really about adoption and um, being able to produce something with your platform that people like. So the great thing about this from a consumer standpoint is that it's opening things up and the winners are really gonna be people that provide great user experiences and great communities and networks where people wanna use it and it's not some hidden black box code that no one can replicate. It's gonna be the best companies that are gonna win. Yeah. I'm sorry, one more follow-up question. So like, would uh, a, an NFT that was minted for, um, on Hyrule Marketplace have value on a different marketplace? Like would it have the same value? Yeah, it, it depends. I, I don't know necessarily how people are going to value it. You know, we're thinking about building, building a platform where uh, we're paying artists back through transactions that occur on our marketplace. So we want to build out a suite of functionality that encourages people to keep it and interact with it in our platform. Um, that doesn't mean that someone can't go on to OpenSea, for example, which is a, a platform for exchanging digital assets. And you can trade crypt crypto kitties or anything off market. Uh, with the nature of blockchain, you can do that freely. So we can't prevent anyone from doing that. Uh, the best that we can do is provide them an awesome experience with our platform and uh, hope that they value what we're providing enough that they're going to continue to use the platform as opposed to taking it somewhere else where they're not going to have the same functionality. All right. Thanks.